So Epicurus and Lucretius on the gods and the soul. So the gods do not control the universe. They they think of the universe as operating by itself through, you know, physical laws of motion. Um, the atoms move, they come together, they break apart. We don't need the gods to be running everything. And further, now this is where things get a little tricky. Um, both Epicurus and Lucretius thought that the gods did exist. And of course, remember they're empiricists, so there must be some evidence of the gods through our senses, right? Or through our internal senses of our thoughts and our feelings. Well, this is, you know, kind of iffy, I think, but Epicurus says specifically that, well, people have ideas about the gods and they're similar across uh, different people, different places. Um, and so therefore they must somehow be coming to us, these ideas about the gods. And he says that we, we get these, these, uh, images of them and these beliefs about them through our senses, through mostly in our dreams, he claims, but also maybe in waking visions. Now, how can we get that? Well, they, we get actually any perception from any object by films of atoms coming off those objects and floating through the air. So if you get a perception of a tree, that's because a film of its outside atoms is floating, uh, you know, the, the, the shape and color of it is floating through the air into your eyes. You know, this is ancient Greece, right? Um, and the same thing is happening with the gods, that they are also made of atoms because everything is made of atoms, right? Or, you know, emptiness. Uh, and we are getting information about the gods through our, uh, uh, our bodies, through maybe in our dreams and to our, our, um, our, you know, internal sensations, possibly into our eyes, if we have kind of waking visions. So they did think that gods existed, but Lucretius and Epicurus also say that the gods are, the images we have of the gods are, are as happy beings, as peaceful beings, and they wouldn't interfere in the universe because that would disturb their peace and their tranquility. Now, as we'll see on Wednesday, when I talk about um, the, the best way to live for these two philosophers, um, they uh, both thought that we ought to live in as much peace and tranquility as possible. And in so doing, we are acting like the gods. So, you know, did, did they really think the gods existed? This is kind of a, a strange idea, even for the ancient Greeks to think that, you know, they don't control the universe and yet they exist as just these purely happy beings. Um, there's some evidence that maybe some people even thought that Epicurus at the time was uh, an atheist and didn't really need the gods and didn't necessarily believe in the gods. We won't focus on that too much. Um, I don't think it's crucial because really, uh, regardless of the existence of the gods for, for Lucretius and Epicurus, the soul does not continue after death. So the soul is not immaterial and it's not immortal. So it's not Im immaterial. I mean, it does exist, but it, like everything else, is made of atoms, right? There's nothing in the universe except atoms and void. So if the soul exists at all, it's made of atoms. And for them, the soul does exist. But what they mean by the soul is similar to um, what we've talked about with Plato in that the soul can be just a sense of that which is... Um, the mind, the thinking part, that can be the soul. For Lucretius and Epicurus, the soul is also that part of you that um, senses things. So the fact that you have any sensation at all, like seeing and hearing, and then are able to think about those things, that's also the soul. And the ability to move your uh, body is done through the soul as well. So there is a soul. It does movement, it does sensation, it does thinking, it basically gives life, um, but it does not continue on after death and it's not immaterial. So the soul and the body are bound together and the soul cannot operate outside the body. And Lucretius has a couple of good examples uh, of this. Lucretius says, and this is in the readings that I asked you to do on um, pages 79 to 81, he says that the mind develops and deteriorates along with the body. So we should think of it as really bound together. That as we 
as we start off as young children, our, our bodies are kind of, you know, not very good yet. We can't really, um, uh, control their movements and the mind is not very good yet either. It can't really control the body and it can't really think that well. So as we get older, the body develops and the mind develops and gets better over time. And as we get further into old age, he claims the body starts deteriorating and the mind starts deteriorating. And he claims this shows that the two things are really quite closely bound together. Similarly, uh, Lucretius says on pages 80 and 81, that when the body is sick, the mind also experiences symptoms of, of not, you know, functioning quite as well. That, uh, you know, you might get dizzy, you might have, find it hard to think, you might find it hard to put things together. Um, so there again, uh, or if you're drinking too much wine, the body is affected and the mind is affected. So he claims that the two things are very closely bound together. And then he claims, he argues, this is Lucretius on page 82, kind of uh, culminating all of this, the body and the mind and vital forces owe their energy and enjoyment of life to their interconnection. Divorced from the body, the substance of the mind cannot by itself produce vital motions. So just the mind by itself does nothing. And the body, once abandoned by the spirit, cannot live on and experience sensation. The fact is that just as an eye ripped from its roots and detached from the rest of the body is unable to see anything. So the spirit and mind evidently have no power by themselves. So you can also think about it just with your sense data. You know, we have no information from the senses that indicates that uh, when the body dies, the mind goes on, right? There's, there's nothing that indicates that that is, is the case from our senses. And, and it would be strange for the mind to be able to do anything without uh, matter, other, you know, bodily matter being attached to it. Um, where would it go? You know, maybe into another body, but we don't have any sense that that would be the same person. That's something that, that Lucretius is going to argue later, and I'll talk about on Wednesday. But both of them agree that the soul and the body are bound together. The soul cannot operate outside the body. And once the body dies, that is it. There is no more sensation. So we get from Epicurus, death is nothing to us. And we'll talk on Wednesday about why he thinks that's the case. That's it for now.